Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ethics Part 3, and tonight I want to look at the ethics of self-driving cars. Now, you're probably thinking, wow, that sounds like about the most boring subject that one could explore, and in general, I would agree with you. However, functionally, I want to use this as an early example of how um, virtually everything is interesting when you start pondering it ethically, because there are so many vexed ethical questions that live in all of these subjects. And what happens culturally is, particularly with things related to technologies, we tend to ask pretty much every question that's not ethical because ethical questions are difficult and they make clear all kinds of subjects that we generally like to have all fogged over and pay no attention to because while technology advances, ethical problems pretty much stay where they've always been. So, to wit, self-driving cars. Now, people may know, or they may or may not know, actually, I guess, is that we're getting very close to having self-driving cars. On the one hand, this seems like a pretty interesting thing and a great technological innovation, and they're actually out on the roads now being tested, and everybody's like, oh, are they safe? Can we trust the technology? Are they going to kill us? Are they going to crash? Woo, you know, these are the questions. And the, and the proponents of this, and billions of dollars are being poured in it by Google and Apple and all the major car, basically every major tech company, every major car company is just throwing money at this concept, which, by the way, should make you slightly suspicious just from the beginning. But, but the question that they keep coming back to is, can we make self-driving cars that are safe or safer than having human drivers around? And the answer they're saying is, yes, we can. And the second we get that done, boy, howdy, we're going to be in the world of, you know, the techno future and everything's going to be great and wonderful. We're going to have self-driving cars and think about all the good things. And this is important. Do think about all the good things. Think about all the people who can't drive. Older people, people with vision impairment, children, right? All of a sudden, mobility is granted to this group of people who right now have to have drivers or feel isolated in society, these sorts of things. So it can be a great benefit. Also, lots of people are killed or injured in road accidents. So if you can reduce that suffering significantly with self-driving cars, that seems like a good idea. And so you can make roads safer. You can increase access. Um, you can also create a system where it's less wasteful, right? If, if self-driving cars are more efficient, they don't burn, use as much energy. Okay, that could be good for the planet and, you know, so on. So you can kind of go through, oh, by the way, commuting, you don't have to drive so you can just sit and maybe do your work or and relax and enjoy yourself people point out all these benefits and go great here we go let's bring on the self-driving cars ah ooh, eek so this is where all of the questions that no one seems to want to talk about and i've been reading some articles both pro and con by the way even a lot of the con people don't really get into too much of this they tend to say on the the safety thing right that really seems is it safe is it not safe that seems to be the core issue. Not that that's not an insignificant one, but the notion is, as the technology people like to frame it, is once we get the safety where we want it to be, where you know the drivers are safer than the average driver or much safer than the average driver, then, hey, presto, problem solved. But actually what this does is it raises basically a whole series of challenging ethical problems, which again, like I said, no one seems to want to talk about too much because of course they just make it confusing. So one thing to ask is to say, okay, we're going to have self-driving cars. Let's say we are, let's say, okay, who owns them? Who should own the self-driving car? Should I own a self-driving car that just drives me around? Now this might be fine. This is our current model of, of car ownership. And in particularly in the United States, where we know that public transportation is communist and it will destroy your children and somehow is bad for the planet and makes your, your country retrograde if you have public transportation. So we won't have it in most of our country. And so, you know, what we're going to do is we're just going to sell everybody who has a car now a new car. Now, on one hand, you can see why this seems like an incredibly good business proposition. Ethically, however, let's say one is so a, let's say, interested in the environment. If I'm interested in the environment, selling everybody a new car this is not really that attractive of a, you know, see what I'm saying? It's like, wow, what we're going to do is just come up with a reason where everybody who has a car has to replace a car. And by replacing the car that has a, you know, the, the, I mean, I just 
obviously the financial impact or, or environmental impact of this is just massive of course it just you know did oh how many millions of cars have to be replaced all the energy all, everything that goes into manufacturing the cars so on and so forth so well that is certainly one model that could be adopted but notice this has very real implications for how our society works and what we're saying then is like we love the way the system works now there's really no problems with it we'll just have everybody replace what they have with a better version of what they have at you know huge economic and environmental cost of course the other problem with this is what about those people who can't afford the very expensive self-driving cars right so no revolution for them because they can't afford that next step then you could say is oh who owns the car what if we made this a type of public transportation now, a lot of people if you if you watch the videos that pr promote this pr say AIs are great or read the articles they're like oh you know most cars spend most of their time just sitting in place so if it were a public system then you know you could have maybe half or, or, or a quarter of the number of cars that exist now and just have them go to everybody's houses and go to their neighborhoods and pick everybody up and you wouldn't have these cars sitting in people's garages and that would be great, right? So this could be if you really emphasize community and access, and then you go, oh, this, is, this would be a great system. So the downside of this is, of course, car companies not that jazzed, not that enthusiastic about reducing the number of cars in circulation by 75% over time. It would increase access for like the old people who can't drive and for, again, people vision impaired, these sorts of things. It would help them immensely. But now we're talking about a public transportation system. And again, the United States, we know this is communism. But also, if you're going to have a public transportation system, you don't want self-driving cars. You probably want self-driving vans and small buses and large buses, right? And trams, for instance. Right now, we have self-driving trams all over the country, all over the world. These work pretty well. So an integrated system of self-driving technology and a comprehensive public transportation system probably makes a certain amount of sense. But notice this is a huge change, certainly, again, in the United States, uh, as, as an approach to transportation. So this is a real fundamental reevaluation of how you're going to provide transportation. Also notice this means that, the, that your uh, government and, uh, you know, government institutions would be paying for and providing the transportation and so again that would be wildly different and so should it be free right should i just you know when i want to go to town i hit a button and you know there, my town sends a car out to my neighborhood and i walk a block or something or maybe just to my front door which would be crazy for where i live and and you know it picks me up and takes me to town i mean i'm all for that but probably a bit expensive um maybe, is it more efficient efficient maybe it's more efficient and so then who owns the cars and or who pays for the cars is, is a huge question. Clearly, again, the car companies want to sell a lot of these. Therefore, they really don't want to replace all the existing private cars with public cars or shared cars, although perhaps that would make sense. But these are the kinds of questions that have to be asked and will have to be answered, by the way, if we're going to adopt these cars some system is going to be adopted so the question is what would be the best one what would be the more eth most ethical one of course and you could base this again on you know do you believe in community transportation do you believe in access do you believe in private ownership is the core to all this do you think that driving corporate profits is the most valuable thing you can do so depending on where your particular ethical scale is you'll have very different answers to how this should be structured um then you have the questions, let's say, let's, if you want to have another version of this, you can say, what about beauty? So if we're going to have massive fleets of cars being added into our communities, should the cars themselves have any sort of design requirements, right? Should we be, should we be able to say, hey, if we're going to say, let's say it's public transportation, or we're going to be making millions and millions of these things because there's just going to be a few models and because they're just transportation now, and those, they're not status symbols. Are there any rules about how they'd be, have to be designed? And anybody who's ridden on subways or things like this, or trains, or recognize immediately like, oh, hey, why are some of them dumps and some of them nice? It, it, should they be nice? If, can we have public nice transportation? Or does it, if it's going to be public, is it going to be crappy, but the private ones get to be really nice? Maybe we'll have tiered 
self-driving, right? Of course, this would be a first class, you know, uh, business class, and then you know, co- coach class. When you when you book plane tickets, right? You have you know, do you want to have a crappy experience, a medium good experience, or a really good experience? Which ca- kind of self-driving car is going to show up at your house? You know this. You know, these sorts of, do we want to have it a tiered or do we want it to be a communal system that says, oh, no, everybody gets the same sort of experience and they're all, you know, relatively nice or re- or we don't want to spend any money and make them really cheap. If there's going to be a lot of them around, should they be beautiful? What colors should they be? Do, are they going to contribute to the aesthetic uh, appeal of the environment in which I find myself? Or is it like, yeah, you know what, it's none of your business. We'll let the companies decide what they're going to look like. Um, these these kinds of questions. Maybe they'll have um, morphic paint on the on the cars that allow the the people who are riding them at the moment to decide what the exterior looks like, right? I, so I could change the appearance of the car as I roll along, <clears throat> and so everybody, so you, all the cars would look different based on you know who was riding in them, which would at least be somewhat cool. Also, let's say that we live in the not too distant future, as the tech people are hoping, where, you know, most self-driving, self-driving cars, most regular cars have been eliminated. And self-driving cars, I keep saying, are super efficient, right? They're super efficient. We're going to need a lot less of them. So this would mean, wow, we should have a lot more space, basically. We don't need so many parking spaces. We don't need so many driveways. We don't actually need as much road space because self-driving cars have taken a lot of cars off the road. So much more efficient. Do we get to re-inhabit that space? Do neighborhoods, do we get to create walking lanes and biking lanes um, in cities and in, and in countryside? Will we just say, hey, basically everything will be, you know, one way and then the self-driving cars just know how to get places and, and that means a whole lane or whole access roads now can be turned over to pedestrian traffic, parkways, you know, we can make this huge transition and say, hey, let's green our cities. Let's turn all these unnecessary or uh, overly wide roads and excess parking into public spaces, into, into walkways and garden spaces and communal spaces and beautiful spaces. See, this would be a huge inv- investment in the environment, in beauty, in civic spaces. Or we can do the reverse of this, which I think is vastly more likely, which is to say, hey, People, dogs, and bicyclists interfere with the efficient operation of self-driving vehicles. So we need to get them is more, get them more off of the road, and and this seems like a like well no of course we won't do that but actually if you look at a lot of the animations and plans for self-driving systems and like getting drivers out of cars, they actually get rid of pedestrians, right? They, <laughs> nothing makes self-driving cars work less good in cities than pedestrians because pedestrians, like, they jaywalk and they take too long to cross through, right, and all this. And so they're saying, hey, we can put systems in place where we don't need stoplights because all the self-driving cars can communicate with each other and optimize for passing through these intersections. And wow, won't that be efficient and fast and no more stopping and you don't have all the problems of left hand against oncoming traffic. And woo, we've solved all those problems because of automation. Woo, as long as there's no, you know, nobody wants to get from one side of the street to the other side of the street. And this is not, again, uh, this is not a mythical scenario because this happened already twice at least. In, in, in our history of, pub, of transportation is because when we went from horses to cars, they had to pass a bunch of laws that made cars have the right of way over horses because as long as horses had the right of way, then cars could really only go at about the speed of horses because they could go down the roadways and then they would hit somebody in a wagon and the person in the wagon doesn't have to pull over. So the car has to wait behind them before it's clear to pass them. Also horses and cars not getting along that well. And so it was a big problem. And so eventually they passed a bunch of laws, both in cities and in countryside, that said, no, look, cars have right of way. We're making a decision for our society that we would rather have cars than we would rather have horses. Same thing in cities. Uh, Roads, before the advent of cars, roads and, and these sort of things were heavily foot trafficked. I mean, people walked down the middle of roads because you might have a train coming by every once in a while. You might have wagons coming by every once in a while or even continuously, but people just cohabitated with them. Once you start to get cars, you have, this is when you have to get all these pedestrian restrictions on. And they say it's to keep pedestrians safe. It, it sort of is, I mean, theoretically, but what it really is to allow cars to go faster and to be more efficient. 
this is a problem. I mean, if you're if you live in the city, one, sorry about that. Two, um, you know, this is the problem with bike lanes and like trying to re-bike it. It's like, yeah, it's great, but it does create problems with parking and like people opening doors and well, I want to pass, but there's a bark lane. You know, these sorts of strictures, like who gets the right of way, who gets the preference? Those are ethical decisions. These are decisions that you have to make in your design. And it seems to me that there's a good chance that, you know, if we have, let's say, you know, this whole system of flawlessly operating, you know, uh, interconnected self-driving cars, and then all of a sudden, you know, 10 kids run across the road and they spend a bunch of time doing it, right? In the efficiency of the whole system, this is going to look like this horrible aberration, right? It's really messing our systems up. But who gets preference? Do the pedestrians get preference? <clears throat> and so... You know, beauty, environment, community, access, all of these questions are going to have to be answered. And as we adopt, as, I, as we may, uh, self-driving cars, they will be answered and they'll be answered with ethical decisions will be made. But usually they aren't made publicly and they aren't made specifically in these terms. Uh, notice another problem is currently in most of the world, I believe, but certainly in the developed world and certainly in the United States, uh, our roads are maintained in part, in fact, in large part by taxes on gasoline. So both at the state, county, city levels and federally, there's big taxes on, well, you know, relatively big taxes on gasoline. And a lot of that money goes to pay for the maintenance of roads. Now, if you go to fleets of electric self-driving car, you're introducing the what's called the free rider problem which is to say now they're using billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of infrastructure and effectively not paying for it, right? So on one hand, we're like, yay, electricity, this is probably, depending on how it's generated, right, probably cleaner than the, its in, internal combustion image, engine. On the other hand, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, these people are, are let's say these are, uh, company-owned electric self-driving cars, so you're paying like a taxi fee, and all that money goes to whoever owns these cars, So, and they don't have to pay any road tax. I mean, that's genius, by the way, from a business proposition, because, yay, if you let me use a, a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure without having to pay anything for it, that's probably a big win. So is that is that what we're shooting for? I mean, is this... Oh, and if not, well, then how do we want to pay to maintain the roads? Who, who pays that tax? Under what terms? Where does that money come from? If it's not going to be coming from where it does now, which is sort of a system we're used to. By the way, I should mention, this doesn't mean the system we have now is like this great ethical achievement. It's simply that when new things come along, they give us an opportunity to go, oh, is fuel tax really a good way to pay for roads? seems sort of like a use tax, but is it really a use tax? How does that work out? And oh, all of a sudden these people aren't using gas. And so that's good because it's good for the environment. But well, wait a second. They're using something without paying the main fee that you pay to maintain the thing that they're using. That's not a very good strategy in the long term, <clears throat> right? So these sorts of questions start to be come to the fore. And that's why new things like self-driving cars become interesting. The one part of the ethics of self-driving cars that people have been meditating on because it's closely related to the software and design is the whole notion of who gets hit, right? So uh, when humans are faced with you know, bad situations in traffic and they have to swerve out the, you know, something falls off a truck or, you know, someone runs in the road, they swerve or break or do something crazy and they hit somebody and we go, wow, that, what, what else are you going to do? It's like crazy thing fell on the road. So they swerved and hit somebody. Now, a self-driving car actually has software that has to decide what to do. And is it, do you brake and just hit whatever's in front of you? Do you swerve out of your lane? Is it better to hit the people next to you than it is to hit the stuff in front of you? Uh, these sorts of classic, now actually, I mentioned that the crazy ethical question earlier about, oh, you can flip a switch on a train track and save a bunch of people on the train, but if you do, you're gonna kill a guy sleeping on the track. Actually, this here we are. It actually is sort of has this real world application here because all of a sudden it's like, oh, should the software choose to protect other people around you and therefore it just do whatever it has to do to, to not harm anybody around you, even if that means you get harmed? 
Or do you want the software in your car to maximize protection for the passengers in the car, which sounds really good if you're a passenger, but so they'll like swerve and hit anybody if it means that you might be injured. And somehow that has to be programmed into the car. These, these sorts of decisions have to be in the software. And so you'll see those sorts of ethical questions raised. Um, and yeah, that's going to be a problem. A couple of others that you'll also see maybe is right now, and you can see this sort of extension of who gets hit problem in the program, is merging onto highways. So self-driving cars have a big problem merging onto freeways because it turns out that there's really no legal way to merge onto a freeway when there's traffic. Because you're basically everyone on the freeways, if they can, is going way too fast and they aren't leaving enough space between cars for you to safely merge. Of course, again, if you've ever merged on a freeway, you're perfectly aware of this and you realize that you kind of just have to, you just have to get in there and, <laughs> you know, find a little opening and jam your car in there and hope for the best. And maybe people honk at you and this is fun road rage for everyone. <clears throat> So, but if you have a self-driving car, can you program it to do illegal things? Is that okay? Because if there's no legal way for it to merge onto a freeway, either A, your self-driving car can't merge onto a freeway, this is not very helpful, or B, you have to program it that says, yeah, well, we know it's illegal, but it's functionally necessary. Now imagine a car that's been programmed to do something illegal causes an accident. Right. You can see, of course, this is this is a legal quagmire and that from which, you know, this is why lawyers get paid a lot of money is to sort through these sorts of messes. Um, and, and it would be a huge mess indeed. So then what do you do? And this is why at some point, like going from horses to cars, we may end up having to have this transition from people piloted cars to computer piloted cars, because the one solution for this is to say, well, look, people should not be driving anyway. They don't have right away. They have to give way to the computers. And that way we can make a self-driving car as long as other people aren't driving around it in stupid ways, which is both probably true, probably much easier to have a self-driving car when there are no people around. But also, is that what we want? Do we want to have a system where it's like, oh, we have self-driving cars, but really they work better if we don't let other people drive even if they want to. So now it's a situation where you go, yeah, you can't drive because it messes up the self-driving for everyone else. Um, that seems to be a big lift, but you know, we'll see these, that means again, it's happened before everybody who had horses and was happily riding around. And then one day cars showed up, probably didn't think they would be told they have to get off the road either, but it turns out they were told they have to get off the road, <laughs> you know? So, uh, don't be, don't be surprised or shocked if these sorts of things happen. Um, and so, yeah, so again, think of these, that's just a very short summary, of course, of some of them. And you can just ask yourself, like, well, what do I value most? What would be the ideal outcome for me? And does that seem to be the way these things are going? Is this seem to be the way the, the, the laws are going to be changed? By the way, there's going to have to be a lot of law changes that make all of this possible. What kind of ownership models do we want? Is it just a leasing model? Of course, everything now is renting, right? They want everybody to pay a fee for everything. So, so do I want to have to be a member of the certain kind of car club like Waymo or, or Ford or something? They go, oh, okay, I have a membership that I pay all the time. And then if I'm a member, a car will come to my house and pick me up. But if I'm not a member, a car won't come to my house and pick me up. Also, there's the question of, do the cars have to go everywhere and pick up people anywhere? Right. So, you know, because this is the whole I love that when they put the first L.A. subway system in, uh, they didn't have any stops in the hood. The subway went right through the hood. Right. Like, right. But they just somehow forgot to put stops there. And then there was some protest by the African-American community and the Hispanic community who said, look, you can't just run a subway through a poor neighborhood and not put any stops on it because you don't want poor people. And they're like, oh, no, no, that was just a design oversight or you know that was you know an earlier version no it was they were totally trying not to put the stop in right well do safe driving cars have to go everywhere and pick up anybody right is is it legal for a company who's running self-driving cars to say you know what we don't want to pick up those kind of people or we're going to charge a lot extra to go into that neighborhood 
right? Those that, again, like the public transportation question, where does it go? Who does it help? Who, who has access? So none of these basic questions, who gets paid, who has access, how does it affect the community? Is it more beautiful? Is it more environmentally friendly? Who controls it? By the way, another aspect of this, um, is the software itself. So you have a lot of different companies developing a lot of different softwares to run self-driving cars. Now this is gonna be unbelievably complicated software. Now, if someone has a demonstrably safer, more efficient software system, shouldn't they be obligated to share that with everybody? Isn't this like, shouldn't you just be, because otherwise like, oh, Ford stuff crashes all the time. You know, Toyota stuff never crashes. Like, well, you know, Ford's like, hey, we got our system. Toyota has their system. And so Toyota, of course, would have ads saying, like, you're, you know, 10 times less likely to die in a Toyota self-driving car than a Ford, and we're not sharing. So, yeah. <laughs> or should it just be like, hey, a big communal project to say, we're going to come up with the safest possible system. And is the software available for inspection? Will this be open source so that people can know, you know, at least theoretically, like how is this actually programmed? What decisions are programmed in there? Or do we just have to take it for granted? This is all behind, you know, digital locks and keys. We're not allowed to know how the decisions are made. We're not allowed what is going on. But we just, you just shut up and get in and the ride is the ride and you don't need to know what's going on. And of course, most of the time, who cares? Like, we don't want to know, but, it, you know, maybe some people do. And maybe it might be nice to know, like, oh, is this car programmed to protect me or to protect pedestrians? And which, I mean, which would I even prefer? Probably we don't want to know that that is an actual question and we'd like to forget about it. But idiot people like me sort of ponder these things and go, yeah, if I was going to get a self-driving car, I'd like to know, like, how it weighs the lives of the various people that are moving along uh, around it. But yeah, these are all the questions that no one wants to discuss or think about or at least make public, particularly not the companies, because, of course, they're, you know, they're companies, so they're trying to maximize profit. They have no interest in these ethical questions. They're like, oh, we're going to provide a service and we're going to charge as much as we possibly can for it. And, you know, end of plan. This is like the extension of their plan. But for the community, for the rest of us, it's an opportunity to stop and say, wow, what would we really like to see for us to have as an outcome of this new uh, technology? Who should get to control it? Who should get to decide? How should it be deployed? Who should pay for it? Should it be beautiful? Should it be quiet? You know, what are, what are the rules? Who gets to ride in them? All, again, you know, all of these sorts of questions that are going to need to be, not only need to be answered, but if these are going to be deployed, these questions will be answered. So then what you can do, if you have some sense of your own values, of your own outlook, you can say, oh, the self-driving car, whatever revolution is really not good at all, right? This is a crappy revolution that what we've got is an expensive system that duplicates existing services might be moderately more safe, but it incredible cost and, and it's exclusive and doesn't allow anybody without money or a significant amount of money to participate and doesn't go to places where everybody I know lives, but it, you know, those, those people are too poor and too, um, not the kind of people we want riding in our cars. Or is it like an open system that it gives access to everybody, unfettered access? It goes pretty much everywhere, is environmentally friendly and beautifies our environment and, and helps bring our communities together by equalizing transportation and access to uh, freedom of movement, which is a really, you know, valuable sort of source of, of, of human sort of expression to be able to move freely around the world it, or around your world, around your neighborhood. This is an important and significant capacity. There's like in Paris, the, the, you can look at the design of the metro systems and the, and the public transportation systems, and you don't have to study them very long to realize who they want to move around and who they don't want to move around. Right? It's pretty painfully obvious that they're finally just putting out uh, some some of these better transportation systems out to some of these, uh, shall we say, 
uh, less desirable neighborhoods, as it were. And, you know, it's these unsubtle cues that large cities and, and, and transportation systems send out to whom, who do we like and who don't we like. And so with, with, with self-driving cars, there you go. These companies aren't pouring billions and billions of dollars into these systems because they care about uh, human community. They think they're going to be able to extract a huge amount of value from it, which is maybe they will. But if they can provide these benefits to the community, hey, if they dramatically lower environmental footprint, dramatically increase safety and make a more beautiful and environmentally friendly environment where people can walk more easily and more safely and we can retree neighborhoods and get rid of all this excess space in our cities that we've set aside for cars and they make biking and rural environments safer because you don't ever get you know hit by big trucks um then hey that's a win then maybe they've earned their billions of dollars uh, but again i remain suspicious and this is what it means to think ethically and to, to, to wrap this up, if we look back again, and if you can, you can pull up these articles online and, and videos and whatnot infinitely, and you'll see almost invariably the only question or the central question that takes up most of the time is the question of, oh, can they make it safe? Very clear technical problem. Same thing as I mentioned before with fusion power. Can they make fusion power work? Okay, that's a question. And it's a technical question. It doesn't mean I don't think that the science and the research shouldn't go forward. I'm all in favor of research and technology. But the question is, okay, but having achieved that, what? Is it a good thing? Is it a thing that's valuable? Does it meet my ethical standards for what would be a huge benefit to my community? And so I'm like, yeah, this is great. Let's get self-driving cars that help everybody get around, help the old people who can't drive now feel less isolated. They can go to the grocery store. They can go out to dinner. They can go see their friends. And the blind people and the young people and the poor people can now have the full kinds of road, motor, and transportation access that middle-class people with, with cars and who are healthy and well now have. Great. All for it. Let's, let's see if we can do that. Um, but again, I remain really suspicious. So when you're thinking ethically, don't forget that even these sort of seeming trivial and technical questions and like, really, God, who cares about all this programming technology, uh, car stuff anyway? Ah, but look, those, these ethical questions are almost always there and their core. And this is what shapes our lives and our communities at a fundamental level. And yet we're almost never asked to ponder them uh, deeply, even when, as with self-driving cars, they're likely to have a pretty significant impact in, in our environments, our lived environments, and the way we relate to people. So example number one, the ethics of self-driving cars. Thank you.